Happy Sabbath, Church. It's such a pleasure to be here today. I don't know about you, but I feel very emotional from the, from the service so far. Um, and as I sat there, I just thought, what a privilege it is for us to know God. Life can really be tough, but our God is awesome. Um, so today we're going to be taking a deep dive into scripture. And for some of you, um, we will cover things that you already know. For others, this may be a fresh experience. But what I want us all to do is to immerse ourselves in the word today. So get out your notebooks if you have them. There's going to be a lot of text that you can take away and that you can go and share with others. Um, and if you prefer to just listen and take information in better that way, then that is fine also. Um, so today is part eight of a nine-part series called The Last Empire. Um, and before we get into it, let's just take a moment to pray. Dear Merciful Father Lord, I just want to thank you for bringing us here today. You know the message that you have for your people, dear Lord. So I'm asking you that you will just cleanse me, purify me, dear Lord, fill me up and let you overflow, dear God. You've said in your word that when your word goes out, it will not return to you void, dear Father. So whatever purpose you have for this message today, dear Lord, I ask that it fulfills what it is supposed to do, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, um, so I'm just going to tell you all a little secret. I can only hear in this ear at the moment, so it feels a bit funny, but um, I know that's not going to get in the way of you receiving this word today. So I have a question for you all. Who here enjoys traveling? Yeah? Or at least they did maybe before the pandemic. Okay. Um, when I was younger, I remember people commenting on the fact that I had a red passport. Now, I don't know if this happened to anybody else. Um, it was mainly one or two friends at school and I think one or two times when I went away. Um, but they seemed to marvel at it. And I had never really thought it meant anything special. I'm still not sure that it does, really. But they told me that a red passport meant I was a British citizen, or more so an EU citizen. Um, but they were like, you've got a British passport, you're a British citizen. So what does being a British citizen mean? And let us see now if we can see this on the screen oh okay okay what does being a british citizen mean so being a british citizen means you have access to free nhs medical care you have the right to vote in elections and stand in public office you have visa free access to 190 countries and um, this was also pre-pandemic it's gone down a bit now but you know, maybe we'll get back to 190. You have no restrictions on your right to work in the UK and can benefit from public funds if needed. And last, but certainly not least, you can live in the UK forever. The British passport is currently deemed the fifth most powerful in the world. And so despite the less than favorable weather, the somewhat messy government. Great Britain still has, give or take a few thousand, 170,000 applications for citizenship each year. And of that 170,000, 76% are granted citizenship. Now, whilst that is a fairly high number, that still leaves over 40,000 people in situations that at times can be life-threatening. They needed to become a British citizen. If you've ever known someone applying to be part of this great British empire, you will see sometimes, just through the stress on their face alone, that this process is not an easy one. If it's not your age, it's your past. If it's not your past, it's the fees. If it's not the fees, it's the length of time. And if it's not the length of time, well, 
It's the life in the UK test. 3,000 facts, 24 questions, one test. So, I thought seeing as we're going to be talking a bit about citizenship today, and I am a British citizen, let me try this test. And I thought, you know what? Let us wake up and let's all, let's all try this test a little bit. So don't worry, there's not 24 questions for you, but we have got a few. Um, people at home, if you're in the chat, again, put your answers in the chat. Um, let's all get involved. So the first question is, who made the first coins to be minted in Britain? Is it A, the people of the Stone Age? B, the Anglo-Saxons? C, the people of the Iron Age? Or D, the Romans? Anyone voting for A? Just a little... No? B? Just a show of hands, anyone? For... Okay, a few people for B. C? Couple in the back, okay. And again, people at home, put your answers in the chat. Or D, the Romans? Okay, so most of us are going for the Romans, right? Okay, I'm sorry, whoever said that? It's C, the people of the Iron Age. Okay? Next question. There are 15 national parks in England, Wales, and Scotland. What are national parks? Are they A, giant greenhouses? B, land formations of columns made from volcanic lava? C, medieval buildings? Or D, areas of protected countryside? Okay, we're gonna go in order. Everyone's gonna have a chance. So, anyone for A? And I hope right now, if you're at home watching, again, put your answers in the chat. Is, is anyone going for B, land formations or volcanic lava? C, medieval buildings. D, areas of protected countryside. Okay, some people still didn't vote, but the majority of us got that one correct, okay. Next question. When walking your dog in a public place, you must ensure, A, that your dog does not play with other dogs, B, that your dog wears a collar showing the name and address of the owner. C, that your dog wears a high-vis jacket. Or D, that your dog does not bark. Who is going for A? That your dog does not play with other dogs. Okay. B, that your dog wears a collar showing the name and address of the owner. Okay. C, that your dog wears a high-vis jacket. I mean, I've never seen this. I've seen some nice jackets, though. And D, that your dog does not bark. Okay, so one. Okay, so I think most of us got that one correct. It is B. Um, I did not know this at all. Okay, and last but not least, what is the last book of the Bible? A, Genesis. B, Titus. C, Proverbs. Or D, Revelation. Who is going for A? Who is going for B? Who is going for C? And who's going for D? Okay. Still, still most of us, not all, that's fine. Um, I'll be honest, that one's not really in there, guys. I just <laughs> wanted to bring us back together, you know. But you get the gist. So these are the kinds of things that a British citizen is expected to know, right? Or that anyone trying to become one must know and score 75% in before they can become a British citizen. And um, as I said, I did the full test and I'll show you my results. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say that I was done a favor being born here and getting my citizenship that way. Um, for those who can't see, I got less than 50% despite living here for nearly 30 years. Life in the UK, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But you know, there was another great empire. Not a great British empire, but a great Israelite empire. Or at least there should have been. Turn with me to Genesis 12, one to three. Um, and for those of you that aren't able to access your Bibles, I have got it on the screen. But we're going we're gonna to look at this a bit more. As I said, we're going to be getting into the word today. 
Okay, so Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Let's read together, or I'll, I'll prompt you actually, as we've got a lot of people today. <laughs> so, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household. To where? The land I will show you. I will make you into what? A great nation, and I will? Bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed how? Through you. Hmm. See, God was trying to do something big with the Israelites. Not only was he positioning them in a place where they could have global reach, but he wanted them to be a light on the hill, leaders, successful people that could use their blessing to be a blessing to the rest of the world. So, so many pages, my people. <laughs> It was God's purpose that Israel would become the greatest nation on earth. The greatest nation on earth. I can't even process that. And how do we know this? Let's turn to Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. Give you all a little time to get there who are looking in your Bibles, but Deuteronomy 28 1, it starts off saying, and if you faithfully obey the word of the Lord your God, being careful to do some of his commandments, all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you where? High above all the nations of the earth. So to become the greatest, what was it that the Israelites needed to do? Yeah? Okay. Obey God. So they needed to be obedient, follow his commandments, right? So if they did this, this promise dictates that Israel would be flourishing. It tells us they will become, they will be set high above all the nations on the earth. And so the fulfillment of this promise would look something like this. So starting from the bottom... They go to the land God shows, they obey his law. As a result of obeying the law, they become great and successful. And from this great success, others will see it and think, how are they so successful? And they will want to learn more. And in that, they will come to know God and learn his ways. And so Israel becomes the greatest and final empire with many nations becoming God's people. Wow. But, as I believe some of us will know, this didn't happen. It got stunted round about here. Disobedience. Hmm. So, if this was God's purpose, God's plan, the Israelites, they didn't do that bit, We're talking about citizenship. What has that got to do with you and me? Well, I forgot to tell you at the start that we're going to be busting some myths today. And the first is that the Israelites alone are God's chosen people. See, many people believe that the Israelites or the Jews alone are God's chosen people, but this is not actually what the word of God says. From time, God has told us, every single one of us, that we have a chance to be an imperial citizenship, an imperial citizen. And again, I'm not going to say this without backing it up. If you turn to Isaiah 45, 22, there is a message from the Lord. It says, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. 
And so even though the Israelites didn't fulfill their part of the plan, Jesus did. Ephesians 2, 15 to 19, it says, Together as one body, Christ reconciled us all to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles, that just means everyone who's not a Jew, who are far away from him, and peace to the Jews who are near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. I'll continue. Paul, a Jew himself, even reveals to us in Romans 2, 28 to 29. It says, no. Oh, let me go back to verse 28, actually, just to set the context. So it says, For you are not a true Jew just because you are born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision, which a lot of people would would have believed in this time. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. A true Jew is who, church? A true Jew is who, church? Okay, remember I said I I can't hear that good still. (laughs) And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by who? The spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Um, And I really like that bit because... I feel what the text is saying speaks for itself, but you know when you read something and you feel like God put that in there just for you? That, that's the experience that I had with that verse. And you know, this, this talk of um, being made right with God through our hearts, through the circumcision of our hearts, this is not an isolated text. If you turn to um, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, Jeremiah 4 verse 4, again, there's this reference all through the Old Testament Um, of circumcision by the heart. But for those of us who are very technical, potentially a bit more sceptical, and who can't see the link between this promise that God gave to Abraham and to us now being this new Israel, let's look at Galatians 3.16. This shows us that the promise made to Abraham about the Israelites is made to us too through Christ. Galatians 3.16, it reads, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. And so... This chapter ends, verse 29, by also telling us, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, so if you are Christ, as in Christ was the seed of Abraham, right? If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we see here that we all get the opportunity to be imperial citizens through what Christ has done for us and us accepting him we then get to take this promise that was given to Abraham. So we've spoken a little bit about um, the Israelites, the promise God gave them. The question now is how do we claim our citizenship? Because we see already that the offer is on the table. God's word tells us, if we even just go back a few verses, still in Galatians 3, 26 to 27. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. 
clothing ourselves in Christ. So based on this text, how do we claim our citizenship? What's the first thing? Faith in Christ, Christ. yep. Sorry, I really can't hear you. Okay, obedience. So obedience is, is there, but in this text specifically, we're talking about faith in Christ, and then I heard someone say baptism, yeah? So again, I'll just read it. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. And again, that's where we receive that promise. So, I guess when we talk about faith in Christ, we understand this is, this is to do with believing in him, entrusting our lives to him. But what do we mean when we talk about baptism? So, I know I've been talking for quite a while and I've shared quite a few texts with you. And I know that I have the tendency sometimes to get a little bit sleepy. So, to wake you all up a bit, I am going to ask you to share what does baptism mean? And how we're going to do this is through this site, Slido. So for those of you that are at home, you can easily do this. Just type in sli.do. For those of you that want to take part here, again, same thing, sli.do. And then the number that you want to use is 228-420. And this will just allow us to just see what we're thinking right now. What does baptism mean? So I'm going to click on it so we can all see our responses. Yeah, the number is 228420. And the question is, what does baptism mean? Um, if you are at home and cannot access the website, you can put your comments in the chat if you would like to. Um, but whatever you type in here is going to come up on the screen for us all to see. Okay, so we've got a public declaration that you choose Christ, washing away of sin, being born again, immersion by water. Wow, a lot of things are coming out already. New birth. Okay, so what this will do, the comments that are most popular will become the biggest and then the, the less popular ones will be around the side, but that's fine. Don't let that change what you want to write down. What does baptism mean? Okay, so we've got dying to your old self and resurrection, removal of the old, newness of life, being made new, full commitment to God and his will. These are beautiful. Um, start and end, I think we've got. Um, life, being made new, being cleansed. Okay, there is so much that is coming up here. Um, and I'll leave you to have a read for yourselves if you can see as well. Okay. So we're getting a general consensus here. Some of the most key messages that are coming out um, is that baptism is about being born again and washing away of sin. Would we agree with that? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so... Thank you for these answers. Those of you that are still putting them in, you can continue to do so. Um, we will move on in about 30 seconds. But again, I just want to give you all a chance to see what we're thinking in the room and at home. Start of a new life with God. Publicly choosing God and washing away our sins. Renewed, being renewed in Christ, marriage to God. Lovely. Okay, I'll wait for a couple more people. So for those who can't see, we've currently had entries from 92 people, 94. Lovely to see so many of you getting involved. Okay, so I will leave it there. You can add your few responses if you would like. And we'll go back to this part of the presentation. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, as many of you have said, Romans 6 actually also gives you a clear indication of where to get this information, right? Um, and it shows us that baptism is about freedom from destructive living, that's that, that sinful life 
that being buried um, and us being able to receive new life in Christ. So, with that said, um, we will have a look at Galatians 2.20. And this, again, just sums it up beautifully. It says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by doing what? Trusting. Trusting in the Son of God. And I think that beautifully relates to Brother Malcolm's point of, again, that obedience. You know, we're, we're giving ourselves over to God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So baptism of faith is essentially a funeral, that death and burial of the old self, a resurrection, raising and being, right, um, being risen in Christ, and then an adoption, gaining that citizenship into God's family. So now that we've spoken about that, and I did see some responses pop up before, do we know how we are to be baptised? Yeah. Some might mention a sprinkling of water. Um, some say infusion. That's like a pouring of water. I've seen mention of rose petals. But as I told you at the start, we are busting some myths today, right? And if we look to Ephesians, the Bible says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So in us looking at what the scripture is saying, we need to know what this one way is, right? Okay. So let us begin with Jesus as our example. There are a few scriptures in the Bible that actually give us some indication of, is it the sprinkling? Is it the infusion? Or is it something else that I think a few of you have mentioned already? So if you look at what's happening in Mark 1, 9 to 10, Jesus has just been baptized, or he, he's about to be baptized. And it says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John, how? In the Jordan. Right, so for something to someone or something to go into something, we can agree there's a, yeah, that's the best way I can describe it. There's a something happening, okay. And you can cross reference this in Matthew three sixteen, which is talking about the same thing, okay. So we've got in, um, and verse ten, sorry, actually says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. So we've got mention of this in we've got mention of up, yeah? And as I showed you, to go into something and to come up from something, it's a bit more than a sprinkle, I might add, yeah? Okay, Acts 8, 38 to 39 says, so this is now talking about a time um, Philip was directed by the Holy Spirit to go and speak to this Ethiopian man on his travels. And what he found, um, when he found this man, he was in his chariot reading Isaiah. And as directed by the Spirit, he asked him, you know, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, you know, if you can teach me, then tell me. And so Philip did. Um, and as they went along their way, they came by some water. And the Ethiopian man said, get the carriage to stop. And it says, they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. So again, we've got this mention of going down, coming up, and it specifically said up out of the water. Okay, so one other thing that I will share with you is where the word baptism actually originates from. And in the Bible, it's the Greek word baptizo. Can we all say that? Baptizo. Baptizo, okay. And baptizo means to dip under, to immerse. It, it's also said to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to bathe or overwhelm. Has anyone ever felt overwhelmed? Yeah. yeah? When you feel overwhelmed, what is that? What kind of, what symbol would you do? <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a lot. Okay, but when we're talking about overwhelm in this sense, that would really match up with this idea of full immersion. When you go into the water and you come up, you're, you're overwhelmed by the water, right? Um, 
So the last text that I will share with you to again, just further back this up is found in John 3, 23. And it says, at this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. So again, this mention of plenty of water is given an indication that you need a lot of water to do the baptism. And so I think we can conclude, correct me if I'm wrong, that the one method of biblical baptism is how? By full immersion. And this is Shanika and Pastor Alex. Happy Sabbath, Shan. (laughs) So... It's interesting because if we even go back to the meaning of baptism, we've looked at the method, full immersion, but if we go back to the meaning of baptism, we see it presents a parallel. What did we say? Funeral. So what part is that? The death. And what does that look like in full immersion? Yeah, going down. Resurrection. What does that look like? Coming up. And then, of course, after that, we have our adoption by Christ. So in full immersion, we see full submission. We see the burial of the old life, the cleansing and emerging as a new creation. And when we're thinking about the importance of baptism, there are a few texts um, that kind of highlight how important it is and also the process that we can take in preparing for baptism. So the first one is found in Acts 2, 38. Um, And as I said at the start, there are a lot of texts today, but these are things that if you may have friends that are thinking about baptism or they're not really sure what it is that, you know, they need to do. These are verses that we can share with them. So the first says, how does it start, people? Repent. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The next tells us in Mark 16, 16, whoever whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And the final text in Matthew 28, 19 says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So what are three things that we can pick out when we're talking about preparing for baptism repent Repent. teaching or if you're the recipient learning yeah one more yeah so each text had a little indication remember this one whoever believes and is baptized will be saved right so we've got repent believe and learn And even looking at that, I know sometimes we can feel, um, for those of us who aren't baptised or thinking about baptism, it can feel like, okay, repent, believe, learn. It it still, still feels a bit like a lot. But you see, repent, when you actually go and look at the definition, it simply means to change one's mind. Yeah, so if you know that the things that you're doing, you're like, this is not really where I'm supposed to be at. And you you confess that, you repent, you say, you know what, I want to change my mind. Believe. All all the Bible says to us is, believe that Jesus came, he died for your sins, he rose again. Believe in him, have faith in him. And then learn. If you're going to give your life to someone, you need to know a little bit about them. You need to start to, to understand who they are. So really, it's not as complex as we may sometimes think it is. But repent, believe and learn. So, again, busting a few more myths, um, now that we know it's you, you need to repent, you need to believe, and you need to learn. This is why we also share that babies can, um, it's a myth that babies can be baptised. Babies can be dedicated to the Lord, um, and we see examples of that in the word, but you wouldn't baptise a baby because they can't repent, believe, and learn for themselves at that young age. Okay, Um, it's a a cognizant decision that needs to be made by the individual. So there's one more thing that we will talk about today. Um, And again, in us kind of looking at baptism, 
We're seeing the process, we're seeing the meaning, we're seeing the method. But some people do ask about rebaptism. And there are three cases when, yeah, based on what we've learned today, there are three cases where this, this may be done, right? So for rebaptism, if you have not been baptized by full immersion, that's the first one, because we've already explained the significance of baptism by full immersion and how it relates to the meaning of it. Uh, the second is if you have raised the old life and turned away from God and left Christ. So some of us may have been baptized and then we decide one day, do you know what? I don't want any part of this. And we've actually decided to turn away from God and go back to our old life. And the third is if you have had significant new truth revealed to you. So um, this third case is based on Acts 19 verses 1 to 5. And it's basically where um, Paul meets some followers of Christ who had been baptized by John. And he, he speaks to them about the Holy Spirit, but they know nothing of the Holy Spirit. And he says, you know, well, how were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized by the hand of John. Um, and so because they were not baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they were rebaptized. But rebaptism is not necessary just because you sinned again. Yeah, um, and I think that's a really clear point for us to understand. Um, the Bible even tells us in Romans that we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see how many times faith is coming up? And that this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And so... Um, another text that we can just look at is when Jesus is with his disciples and it's found in um, John 13, I believe. And it's, um, when Jesus came to wash Peter's feet, he wouldn't let Jesus. And when Jesus said that he could have no um, eternal inheritance unless he allowed Jesus to wash his feet, Peter said, well, then wash me all over. But Christ responded, no, Peter, if you have had a bath, meaning baptism, then you only need your feet washed. So again, we don't need to be rebaptized every time we make a mistake or commit what we deem as a serious sin. So baptism is the Bible's teaching of how to become a true Israelite, right? Mm -hmm. One of the citizens of the last empire that will be set up at Christ's soon return. And I'm just going to share with you a quick story that was shared with me. Um, and it was about a young, Rus young Russian man that had terminal cancer. And Mark Finley was in Russia at the time conducting evangelistic meetings. And this young man came, he attended, and he said, I want to be baptised, but he was too sick to be baptised with the other people. And when Mark visited him, he just was like, Pastor, please baptise me. Mark explained to him that because he was so sick, he was like the thief on the cross who was unable to be baptised because of the circumstances. But the young man was adamant, Pastor Mark, please baptise me. Mark wondered how. But he then asked if there was a bathtub in the house. And there was. So Mark baptised the young man in the bathtub. And he said that immersing this young man dying with cancer, who was so deeply committed to Jesus in a bathtub, was actually his most memorable experience. And it was interesting when I heard this story because I've seen similar situations in the lockdown where people have been baptised in, in bathtubs. And I know that sometimes we might look and think, oh, that's strange, you know, it's, it's not the done thing. But I think this more so reminds us that nothing should stop us from giving our lives to Christ. Not COVID, not cancer, and that being baptised where possible is, is really the thing that we ought to do. The Bible goes on to tell us, what are we waiting for? Get up, be baptised, and wash your sins away by calling on his name. So, many of us may be baptised here already, 
Some of us may still not be sure if it's a decision for us or we'll still be thinking about that decision. But I hope that some of the questions around baptism, about why we do it, um, about how we do it, have been answered today. And that we've seen that joining God's family is actually simple. Turn to me and be saved, he says. Be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. See, unlike the hoops that this England has for us to jump through to gain citizenship, um, and to, if, if we're even worthy of it in their eyes. Our God just wants to know if we believe. And if we do, then he invites us to unite with Christ, to abide with him, and to demonstrate this through baptism. A full immersion showing our total commitment and surrender to him, and a public acceptance of this imperial citizenship. See, being an imperial citizen means you welcome Holy Spirit care. You welcome the right to vote and stand in public for our Jesus. You have access to anywhere the Spirit of God wants to take you. You have no restrictions on your right to work in his will and benefit from his provision when needed. And best of all, you can live in his kingdom forever. Amen. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I remember hearing messages about God's love for me, his grace and being asked if he was knocking at the door of my heart. You know when we were back in the day, go to the camp meetings and the SEC events and um, I would feel this pounding sensation, my ears would start burning, and I would literally feel the Holy Spirit knocking on my heart, telling me like, are you gonna let me in? But I would think, what would he see when he entered? Would it be clean enough? I'm not perfect enough, I'm not quite ready yet. I, I, I can't be sure that I can do this. But choosing to accept Jesus is not a graduation from a Christian life. It is simply the beginning. Just like the story of Mary and Martha, Jesus doesn't require us to be busy trying to sort things out in our own life. He doesn't require us to be righteous or perfect. He just calls us to believe to have faith in him and make a decision from that point forward to do life with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn to me and be saved is literally what baptism is all about. It's you going one way and making a decision to turn in the other direction. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to still have to go past the temptations or that you won't still make mistakes, but your focus is different. You're not perfect, but you're committed. You are abiding in Christ and Christ is in you. So although you're going back past those same things, you're not dealing with life alone. You are moving with the guidance of the spirit of the living God. People, it is powerful stuff being an imperial citizen. Accessing the Holy Spirit and living in accordance with God's will. I will testify to that. But ultimately, it's a choice. A choice to keep going wherever you're going or a choice to turn to him. He can do the rest. He just needs us to turn and give him our heart. So at this time, I just want to give us a chance to self-reflect. Some of us, in fact, close your eyes if you need to, because I know sometimes... You want to make decisions, but the pressure of people 
Yeah, and it's just a moment for us to just think for ourselves. Some of us, we've been baptised, but we're struggling. And we just need God to remind us that we're not alone. That you've got this because he's got you. Maybe you've fallen off the wagon and you're finding yourself spiralling. And you just need to get back on track. Perhaps you want to take this opportunity to recommit your life to Christ. To choose him today, to have him renew a right spirit within you. Or maybe today, the Holy Spirit is knocking at your heart. And you're not sure how, but you know you want to change direction or go further into his arms. You may want to be baptised. If any of the above apply to you, whether you're here or at home, please just stand with me as we pray. And if baptism is something that you decide you want today, um, or you just need to have a talk after this, please come and find me at the end and we can look at how we can further support you as a church. Okay, we'll pray. Dear Merciful Father, Lord, I want to thank you once again for this opportunity, dear Lord, to share the word that you have given me to share. I want to thank you for letting us have a deeper understanding about the things that you say, dear God, through your word. And I want to just present those that are here today, dear Lord. There may be people who are making decisions right now in their heart's view. There may be those that are battling There may be those who have already given their lives to you, dear Lord, but just want to realign their focus to ensure that they are focused on you, dear Lord, and that their their life is representing that. I ask that wherever, wherever we are at, dear Lord, however we are feeling, dear Lord, that you will just guide us and that you will allow us to be receptive to your spirit, dear Father. You've already told us in your word that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, dear Father. Please don't allow our flesh to um, overcome, dear Lord, what it is that your spirit wants to do within us. So I ask that you will please just help us to finalise those decisions, whatever they may be, wherever we are at, dear God, and that we will go forward from this day, dear Lord, with a a newfound joy, with a, a newfound faith in you, dear Lord, with a just a greater desire, dear Father, to serve you and to love you and to represent you. These things I ask in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen.